Let us discuss time of flight measurement with subsampling period resolution using software defined radio. This is a work that was completed by myself, Jean Michel Fried, and my colleague uh, Gwenel Goevic Miru in the framework of our work on using digital electronics for time and frequency dissemination applications. Uh, so what, what is the objective of this work? Usually when we collect data using software defined radio, we consider the sampling rate FS clocking uh, the A to D converter, and we say that the sampling period TS is one over FS, the sampling period, and the time resolution of the samples is TS. So whatever the time delay in the subsequent uh, processing, each data uh, in a continuous stream is timestamped uh, implicitly every TS. Uh, period and uh, there is uh, no need to know better than this uh, what is the time in the uh, subsequent processing. Now this story is uh, found in the radar range resolution delta R where we say that C the speed of light divided by 2 for a two-way trip divided by the B the bandwidth, the radio frequency bandwidth which defines the sampling frequency FS at baseband once the radar signal has been brought back to baseband for sampling. The question here is whether are we limited in our timing resolution by TS or is there anything better that we can do than uh, sampling period TS. And to help us get an insight, here is a quick uh, numerical simulation. So we generated uh, sample, random samples and we spread the information over adjacent samples. So in this case, so to the adjacent 30 samples by convolution. And what you see is that afterwards we take one every 10 uh, samples. So we have one every 10 samples that was uh, spread information uh, between adjacent samples and we move them by one, two, three, up to six. So basically we're moving the sample, the sequence, by less than one period since we decimate by a factor of 10. Now your cross-correlation peak will always be at zero because the autocorrelation of a random signal is always zero, but if you look at the shape of the cross-correlation, you see that uh, we already have the insight that we're going to see something below the sampling period because the shape of a correlation peak will give us some sort of information on a sub-period uh, resolution. Now, this is due to the fact that we have a unique correlation peak, a unique sharp correlation peak, uh, and not a one-to-one -one relation between frequency domain and time domain. And uh, actually, so you see that by using a parabola fit here or uh, some sort of fitting procedure, we might have some sort of super resolution uh, on the uh, uh, time of flight better than the sampling period. So here we have already the idea that uh, fitting this correlation peak will allow us to get a time of flight with a much better resolution than the uh, sampling period. So this is something that we've been using for a long time. Uh, for example, uh, so the assumption uh, in this calculation is that information has been spread over many samples. If you take uh, a pulse radar where you have a unique pulse, there is nothing you can do because the pulse is either detected before or after one period, sampling period, and that's it. But if you spread information over many periods, such as uh, using a frequency sweep or using a noise radar, then you will be able to correlate by correlating, you look at the time delay over many samples and thanks to this correlation you will be able to have subsampling period resolution and you can actually show that the improvement is on the time uh, resolution is equal to a signal to noise ratio in, in the detected power. So the cross correlation will be the core uh, processing step using oversampling and polynomial fit. And what you see in this example is uh, the measurement from uh, Meinflingen DCF77 to Besançon, uh, 400 kilometers away since end of 2016. And DCF77 has two modulation schemes, one amplitude modulation and uh, the historic modulation. And in 1988, uh, the phase modulation was added. And this phase modulation uh, spreads at uh, 645 hertz, let's say 700 hertz. So a naive approach would tell you that your time resolution would be 1 over 700 is 1.5 millisecond. And yet you see that over many years we have much better than 1.5 millisecond resolution because this is exactly what we're doing. We're sampling DCF77 with respect to GPS 1 PPS. And by uh, making this polynomial fit of a DCF77 signal, we can 
can get well below 1.5 millisecond. Actually, if we zoom in to a single month of measurement last summer, you see that uh, most of the fluctuation is actually real fluctuations. It's the day and light with the sun setting and the sun rising, and the actual thickness of the line of the measurement is in the 10 microsecond range. So we can get a hundredfold improvement between the 1.5 millisecond inverse of the bandwidth and the, one, the 10 microsecond that we actually do get over here. So that will tell us how we can do measurement at much finer granularity than the sampling period. So what we're interested in is qualifying the uh, coherence of dual channel SDR receiver, whether the X310, which is a baseband receiver with the A2D converter directly connected to the FPGA, a B210 at this research with its AD9361 front end from analog device, which is a very complex front end taking care of the transposition from radio frequency band to baseband and with unknown latencies because we have no idea what's happening in this black box and the XRX which is a LAM microsystem at MS7002 front end on a PCI Express uh, board. So to qualify the soft certified radio front ends, we feed an external 10 MHz and 1 PPS, hoping that maybe the 1 PPS will allow us to synchronize the various A to D converter in addition to being clocked at the same frequency, so synchronization in addition to synchronization. And this qualification will be done by recording in uh, two uh, channels the same signal that was produced by a pseudo-random number sequence generator in an FPGA where it was programmed by Gwen. And uh, the output of the uh, FPGA, which is a 7 MHz intermediate frequency as a standard for space communication, with its uh, binary phase shift key BPSK modulations allowing the pseudo-random sequence uh, to be recovered after demodulation, uh, is toggling a GPIO. The unwanted uh, spectral components are uh, removed using a surface acoustic wave filter, and the same signal is split into both uh, channels. Now, in this first example, Every clock is produced by high quality uh, source, whether hydrogen maser, whether no clock clock. So the 10 megahertz and one PPS are the same one that feed the FPGA and the SGR. So this is the new radio flow chart where you actually have one uh, X310, they take care to use external source for the clock and for the timing information. And we just take a known number of samples that we send into the uh, file sync for post-processing. If we wish to qualify two, software defined radio receiver, we just duplicate the whole flow chart in a second uh, recording system. So this is the actual setup that looks like. Here you've got the uh, GitHub repository of the PRN generator written in Amaranth to be portable between multiple uh, FPGA as seen on this uh, picture here. You've got uh, the uh, PRN generator which is clocked using, uh, so the octo clock is generating a sine wave, the FPGA wants a square wave, so this is a comparator that transforms the sine into a square, feeding the FPGA here with a uh, high quality clock and the output of this FPGA is either uh, amplified because the X310 receiver needs uh, 6 dBm to work full scale range, so it's either amplified and split or directly split benefiting from the uh, front end amplification of the AD9361. Here is the B210 receiver, here is the X310 receivers with basic RX which are just balloons uh, converting the unbalanced signal into the balanced signal of the uh, A2D converter. So this is our experimental setup and the first question we might wonder is when we do measurements of this pseudo-random sequence and analyze the time delay, first of all, do we get something consistent? And secondly, is the 1 PPS enough to synchronize the, all the channels of these receivers? And the short answer is no. Uh, if, for example, you look uh, at one channel, so along the x-axis, you've got something like 10 second measurement because each uh, code lasts for 40 milliseconds. And you see you have here 250 codes. So that's 250 times 40 milliseconds. And uh, the multiple curves are because we repeat the experiment multiple times. And what you see is that if we look at one channel or the other channel, the one PPS is not enough to uh, synchronize them because from one measurement to the other, they just jump randomly. So the measurements are randomly distributed inside the sampling period. Uh, the B210, X310 or XTRX are always set to measure at five mega sample per second, which is 200 
200 nanosecond period, and you see that indeed the samples are uniformly distributed somewhere in the 200 nanosecond of the sampling period. So the one PPS will not be enough to make sure that the samples are always at the same position with respect to this timing sequence. Yet, when we do one measurement with res one channel with respect to the other, you see now that the y-axis has collapsed into a few hundred picoseconds. So actually, maximum minus minimum is 104 picoseconds in the case of a B210. So still, we have a very complex front end, so it's not zero, but we have something with jumps that have been uh, controlled. And uh, each both channel is actually sampling the same sort of random sequence within one measurement you see that we get something like 40 picosecond standard deviation and from one measurement to the other we get something like 100 picosecond. Again, everything being clogged by the same reference signal. So part of this uh, fluctuation is coming from the AD9361 front end, which is a black box, we have no idea what the delays are. If on the opposite we take an X310, which is directly the A2D converter going to the uh, FPGA, we see that again we have shrunk the uh, delay from one measurement to the other. Each color is a new sequence of measurement. Along the X axis is the one measurement for 10 seconds. And you see now that all the measurements are uh, fluctuating. So within each curve we have something like 4 picosecond standard deviation and 8.7 picosecond maximum to minimum. So that's sub 10 picoseconds. And uh, another interesting fact is that if we claim that we're measuring uh, time delays with sub 10 picoseconds, well, what if we introduce some delay between one reference channel and the measurement channel? So if we, if we add one of these SMA connectors uh, into one of the cables, you see here the mean value prior to introducing the connector was something like 90 picoseconds, 0 0.09 nanoseconds. And here you see we had something like 15 picoseconds. So 90 minus 15 picoseconds is 75 picoseconds. And assuming a speed of light in the quarks cable of 60% of a speed in vacuum, which is 200 meter per microsecond, well, you see that this time delay of 75 picoseconds would be equivalent to 1.5 centimeter uh, time delay, uh, de length delay, length difference. And indeed, if you look at the geometry of such a connector, you've got something like 7 millimeter and another 7 millimeter, which is 14 millimeter additional path. So this means that the mean value here is indeed consistent with the added length in one cable with respect to the other. So all these experiments were performed with the same high quality clock, clocking the FPGA and the software defined radio. What happens if actually the software defined radio are running on their free running term temperature control crystal oscillator, their TCXO? Well, what happens is that both channels will be drifting over time with respect to the high quality clock clocking the FPGA. Here, the 10 nanosecond offset was introduced on purpose to differentiate the two curves. Uh, but when you do the difference between the two channels, you see that the delay cancels and you return to something like sub picosecond standard deviation and fluctuations. So the common mode local oscillator will be rejected as long as you don't have an awfully poor uh, local oscillator, but uh, you will be able to recover this uh, time delay even if your local oscillator induces some drift with respect to the reference signal. So this is a story for one X310. Now what happens if we want to cascade X310s? So we want to have multiple X310s, all of them uh, receiving the same sort of random sequence. And can we use uh, one channel of one X310 with respect to another channel of another X310, considering that all X310s will have one channel fed by the pseudo random sequence for synchronization? So in this experiment, two X310s are fed with a pseudo-random sequence. You see that 1 minus 2 is the two channels of the first X310, and uh, they uh, exhibit low standard deviation. Uh, 3 and 4 do exhibit low standard deviation as well. That's the two channels of the second X310. But most interestingly, if we compare one channel of one X310 with another channel of the other X310, they also exhibit uh, some uh, coherence. Now, if we were not to synchronize, this is what you see over here, 
both X310 behave as individual channels within the X310. They are randomly distributed within the sampling period, but if we're using our uh, synchronization procedure, you do see that uh, the various X310's channels can be considered to be synchronized. And this is important for multiband GNSS measurement because uh, one uh, GNSS uh, constellation bandwidth is in the tens of megahertz, which is accessible to an X310, but the various L1, L2, L5 bands are distributed between 1.1 and 1.6 gigahertz, most more or less, and uh, the 500 megahertz is much more than what an X310 could achieve. So if we want to have multi-constellation GNSS measurement, we will need to cascade multiple X310s, hence the need to guarantee the synchronization between the measurement channel, considering that one of the channels is dedicated to synchronization by sampling the pseudorandom sequence. So this tells us that we can measure multiple X310, and now what we can do is try to synchronize uh, B210 with X310. So again, we have four channels, two B210, two X310 chan uh, cha in each, and again, if you just take randomly the uh, B210 with respect to the X310, they are randomly distributed in the sampling period. However, if we refer to this common clock, that with this common signal pseudorandom sequence, you see here the X310 with its uh, picosecond fluctuation. Here you see the uh, B210 with its something like 40 picosecond fluctuation, the AD93 something uh, front end, and they are both uh, in the plus or minus 50 picosecond range. So that tells you that indeed by using the same procedure, well, the X B210 is of course well degraded with respect to the X310 due to the AD uh, front end, but nevertheless, you can synchronize. Now here in the X axis, you've got the measurement index, again, 40 milliseconds per measurement per code multiplied by 380 codes is about a uh, 15 second measurement. And we repeat the measurement a thousand times. So this is the thickness of a curve, uh, 1000 measurement. If now we look at the mean value as a function of time, uh, here are the 1000 measurements and you show the time delay mean value within each curve, you see that, well, it fluctuates randomly. However, if we zoom into the X310 alone, we will see some sort of structure appearing. So the B210 fluctuation appears to be completely random in this uh, 30 picosecond standard deviation, but the X310 seems to have a pattern. Now remember, each, each one of these measurements, we stop the X310, we restart the measurement, record the data, stop the X310, restart again, and yet there is some periodicity, which at the moment we cannot explain. So this is uh, uh, a, a night duration experiment. Uh, each measurement is taking about half a minute and we have a thousand measurements. So uh, that will take uh, a few hours. And yet you do see that the X310, uh, one channel with respect to the other has moved. This is a one picosecond per graduation. So by, by about two picosecond overnight. We can finalize this set of measurements with the XTRX, which is an aligned microsystem front end. Here you've got the time delay with no synchronization, just looking at the X310 versus XTRX. And uh, again, they are just randomly distributed in the plus or minus uh, 100 nanosecond range of a sampling period if we don't do any uh, uh, matching procedure. Nevertheless, if we now center everything and say we look at the measurement of the XTRX with respect to the X310, so first of all, if we do X310 versus X310, we return to our sub picosecond fluctuation, which is what we saw earlier. But now you see that the Lyme microsystem is behaving completely different to the ADI or the baseband measurement. Here, over 15 second measurement, we have a drift of about 200 picoseconds and in actually a random direction. There is no predictability in which direction one channel of the XTRX will drift with respect to the other. So this is a completely different behavior which has a strong impact on the integration uh, duration because if you want to have low integration for high signal to noise ratio, well, this means that uh, at some point this uh, phase rotation might end up cancelling your ability to accumulate energy during a, a correlation. So this will also impact our ability for uh, beam steering or phase analysis. So this is an important drift of, of one channel with respect to the other. Again, in the sub-sampling period, remember here the XTRX is sampling at 5 megasamples per second or 200 nanosecond period.
So this concludes the presentation about sub uh, sampling period uh, measurement resolution. We see that both X310 and B210 are usable for sub 100 picosecond time transfer. The XTRX is more questionable. Uh, if we consider 200 picosecond at 1.57 gigahertz, which is the GPS L1 frequency, you see that we have somewhat 110 angular degree phase rotation, which starts uh, preventing our ability to accumulate energy in a correlation or in a radar analysis. And uh, as a conclusion, here are a couple of references published by NHT in Tokyo, Japan, where they are developing the YY, the wireless interferometry time transfer system, ground-based uh, system, and including the measurement of uh, moisture in uh, atmosphere using fine time delay. And this is their qualification of the N210 front end, which is quite close to the X310 and indeed they have consistent results with the one we just showed because as you can see here they have much less than 10 picosecond standard deviation and they can detect uh, displacement or la cable length variation uh, uh, in this order of uh, magnitude of 10 picosecond. Thank you for your attention.